Good morning, good afternoon, and a very good evening to you, wherever you may be. My name is Vajahat Said Khan. I'm a journalist based in New York City, covering Pakistan and the rest of South Asia. It was the political party that swore to break Pakistan's dynastic two-party system. But when it did, it became a party of the system and cozied up to the generals who run the world's fifth most populous country. And when the generals turned their back and reverted to the old kleptocratic dynasties, then Imran Khan's PTI became something else, truly popular, truly angry, and driven to come back stronger and harder. But by the time it went to the polls last month, the party had all but broken up. Its founder behind bars, its workers killed, abducted, and tortured, its leaders blamed for treason, and its votes as was widely claimed and documented, stolen. Today, almost 40 days after Pakistan's landmark elections, we try to grapple with the basics of this confounding, unprecedented situation in the country's recent history. A party that's in parliament, but not under its own name. A leader who leads it, but can't meet his party workers because he's in jail, in opposition in the center, but also in charge of a critical province in the Northwest. And now with mounting evidence of infighting and intrigue confronted by disciplinary and legal problems. Today, we do a deep dive about contemporary Pakistani politics with one of the Pakistan Tariq Saf's most loud and proud leaders. And I'm glad to say that it is a she. Shandana Gulzar Khan from the mighty Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province. You are the member of the National Assembly for the Pakistan Tariq Saab. There's a bevy of questions I have for you. I'm going to give you a choice to start. Uh, we can talk about rigging. We can talk about infighting. We can talk about your legal own goals. We can talk about the fate and security of your leader, Imran Khan. Or we can talk about women like you who have been specifically and particularly targeted by the regime. Where do you want to start? The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ujahat, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I think we are good to go in terms of, I mean, there is no chronological order to disorder, but we can start with the rigging. So let's go. All right. Give me the rigging 101 like I am five years old. Tell it to me like I, I don't know about it. What do I not know? So there were three phases of the rigging. <clears throat> there was uh, pre-poll rigging, there was election day rigging, and there was post-poll rigging. And of course, uh, all along, as we say, the ugly background music was um, the reinfiltration of, of terrorist elements into Pakistan. So we lost a lot of police, a lot of armed personnel, army, uh, young Javans, uh, civilians in the last uh, six months in particular. But since Khan has left, uh, we've been uh, targeted repeatedly, in particular my province, uh, to uh, extremist terrorism. So there's been that layer of fear. Then, of course, there's been these uh, random abductions. I was, along with thousands of people from my party, abducted. I don't say arrested because for an arrest, you need a warrant. And we were picked up under this archaic uh, sort of uh, the British colonial era uh, document called the 3MPO, the Maintenance of Public Order, where you may pick up anyone you like. So from these kind of tactics, asking us to leave the party, leave Imran Khan, paint him in a bad light. If you recall, um, there was firing on Imran Khan, an assassination attempt nearly two years ago. But before that was done, he was being painted as some sort of heretic. There's a funny balance. He's either a, a you know Muslim pro-Max or he's a heretic. So they really can't figure out their game. <laughs> and, uh, then uh, there, was, uh, there were three raids carried out on different... Uh, my mother, just as by example, who's a non-political actor, but thousands of women in Pakistan were persecuted, Sharia's mother. So this fear that you will be arrested or go to jail regardless of uh, whether you're politically active or not, as long as you're related to somebody who is politically active, that's been a horrific chapter in Pakistan's history for the last two years. And sadly, I have to say this, other than the UN, which and that too rarely, not many spoke up for Pakistani women. You see them speaking for Mahsa Amini, you see them speaking for Afghan girls' education, but no one spoke for Pakistani women. There was deafening silence, in particular from DC. So in some sense, now we know our place in the world. And, and uh, perhaps we're not relying on anybody else to fight our battles anymore. We, the sisterhood, can take care of ourselves. 
So that was it. Then, of course, there was the organized people rigging, uh, not accepting our papers, disqualifying us from every possible uh, front. I, I, give, I give you my own example because perhaps that's the least of all the hostile things they could have done. My papers were rejected by the um, by the presiding officer, by the returning officer in Peshawar. Then I had to go to high court to appeal that. Uh, I was laden with bills from the National Assembly residence where I used to live nearly 10 years ago, before uh, 10 months ago before we were evicted. I had to pay the bills of another senator from another party who was living there. It was like complete macabre comedy. I've never <laughs> seen things as dark. You know how dark comedies are because it, all along it was funny. We knew it wasn't going to work. This is not how you defeat the political power. That's how you further make it popular. And then, of course, there were the other things. Uh, the, the, the people, uh, whoever was going to the high court, my, my relatives, my family, my friends were going to deposit my case. They had to go wearing masks and chadars, may, men wearing chadars, so that they wouldn't be arrested by the, uh, by the police, which was then uh, with the caretaker administration, which is fondly referred to as the undertaker administration by uh, Mengal Saab from Balochistan. So it was quite weird, but Alhamdulillah, we sort of prevailed. Uh, post that, if we fast forward it to the election day, the day before there was a bomb blast, a really sad bomb blast in Bashin in Balochistan, and uh, 25 different personnel were killed again at EAs. And because of that, they imposed a ban in Pakistan that we could not use our mobile phones or WhatsApp. So internet was down, the telephones were down. We knew exactly what was going to happen. I think what happened was uh, the underestimation of the will of the people had. Uh, the authorities realized their mistake at some point. Perhaps the people of Pakistan would have been sympathetic. But the kind of barbarism that took place, you know, differently able people, the elderly, the children, uh, women, everybody was subject to a funny kind of terrorism in the name of political uh, maneuvering. That sort of got the people moving. And the 8th of February, for me at least, will be a landmark day in the history of Pakistan's resolution in terms of who they are. The identity was triggered. Uh, they knew they were Pakistanis, if not Punjabi, Pathan, Sindhi, Musliman, Baloch. They were all Pakistanis and they were good to go out come hell or high water. And that's what happened. And so we were winning by a landslide. And then come 3 a.m., the election commissioner disappears. Now that's a post poll rigging because by 2 a.m., the, pres the presiding and the returning officers should have tallied all their counts. That didn't happen. The gentleman disappears, comes back at 6 a.m. On the 9th of February, we have another impromptu election in Pakistan. And every uh, member of PTI, uh, we were a thousand candidates. and more than 70% of our results were reversed. And it was done in such a clumsy way, like the vote of no confidence, equally clumsy, badly done, that everybody now knows what is happening. And uh, so since Khan was refusing to negotiate with any of the PDMers for what they had done to us over the last two years, in particular the abuse and violence, let alone the political problems, we were not going to negotiate with them. So now Noon League is desperate, uh, you know, the, the governing party allegedly, uh, Form 47ers as we call them, they want now a strong government of their own. So what are they going to do? They don't only stole the mandate, they stole the vote. They're going to steal the oath too. So I doubt we've seen such dark days in Pakistan's democracy, let alone Pakistan's economy. So here we are. I've, I've, I've tried to be as brief as possible, but it is laden with landmines. Yeah, that, so yeah, yeah. that serves the purpose. There's a, there's a lot to unpack there, but I, I must say, um, I must say, what is the original sin that you and your party and your leader have committed for this unprecedented treatment. I mean, what in the world have you guys done? Because uh, this is not normal. We've seen parties um, um, treated unfairly in the past in Pakistan's checkered history. But it, you guys really, the PTI and Imran, and especially the women of the party, even as you've laid out, it, you, you guys really stand out as a case study. Of uh, of the of the of the iron hand of the regime, what have you done wrong? It depends on whom you talk to. My version will always be pro Imran Khan, pro me, pro PTI. The others will have a different version, as you sort of Let's pointed out. Version. All right. So when I was, no, I, I guess in some sense, uh, my word will have a little bit more credibility because I wasn't a politician at the time that this was happening. I was simply a legal advisor to, of all people, United States uh, aid program in Pakistan. Hmm. I was based in Commerce Ministry, and we started hearing 10 months before the election that uh, there was a lot of maneuvering going on, that the junior Sharif has been handpicked by, uh, the, the, as you know, our grandfathers, uh, the American establishment, and he would run the show because there were rumors that they wanted normalization of Pakistani relations with Israel. 
uh, and in addition, there was going to be some sort of handover of territory to India comprising AJKGB and um, Gilgit Baltistan, Azad Jumo Kashmir, and uh, occupied Kashmir. So that was a bit frightening, but we thought, you know, it's a country full of rumors. Uh, and then we heard Shabazz was a chosen man. And then we heard that Shabazz, um, Nawaz Sharif was not playing ball. He was insisting it was going to be his daughter who deserved the throne hmm. of Pakistan. <clears throat> so, you know, this is, a, 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 I don't know if you recall the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which had been passed by the National Assembly, wherein the Sharif family was going to be the first royal family of Pakistan uh, back in the day, but then that was defeated by the Senate. So it was along those lines. 97. Um, sorry? 97. 97. Yes, absolutely. So when that wasn't going to happen, then they were looking for a scapegoat where they could have sort of a hung parliament, uh, which could be controlled externally. Remember, we may have regime control in Pakistan, what we call the hybrid government people, but there's always an external hand playing a role. And the reason I say this is because we've had, uh, we're one of the few unlucky countries that in our 76 years of independence, we have five or six assassinated prime ministers, would-be prime ministers, or their siblings, starting from Qadi Azam to Liaquat Ali Khan to Fatma Jinnah to Bhutto and uh, Bhutto Saab and to Be Benazir Bhutto. I don't count um, the gentleman uh, Ziaul Haq Sahib in it because uh, he doesn't fall into any of the elected or non-elected categories. He was a direct agent, uh, sort of employed for doing uh, carrying out certain tasks, but he met the same fate as well. The only difference being that the elected ones were not aware of what was happening to them or if they were aware, they didn't have a choice and he sort of knew what was happening. So we're a country which has never really come out of the colonial yoke. And instead of having the old colonizers, we got in a host uh, of others. And that would have been fine too, being a colonized country, we at least got something out of it. All we got was poverty, disease, uh, internal strife, uh, sectarian wars, all completely unnecessary, uh, simply to keep China at bay and to sort out Iran. But we both know, having read history, that's not how things work. History has a way of surprising even the best laid plans. So that is one aspect. The second aspect was Khan was chosen, or as they used to call him, selected, because there was no other option. Uh, President Zardari at the time had uh, wreaked havoc on People's Party, the kind that even Zia couldn't. So they were marginalized and restricted to sin. So there was nobody else who had a credible face, who had a following. And so they decided that he would be their boy. But what was interesting is they clearly hadn't, didn't know him. When we won the election on the, uh, in 2018, we were winning with 172 seats. This I know because I was following that election. I was a reserve candidate. And overnight, the RTS system sat down and we were reduced to 128. So even that time, nearly 45 to 50 seats were taken from us. And that we couldn't figure out. That was only by five or seven, five or seven um, uh, tiny margins. So somebody lost by 50, somebody lost by 700. Shah Farman, our ex-governor, lost by 50 votes in a recount. So it was really funny because when people said you're selected, I said, that's not how selection works. You give them a full mandate. You don't give them a hung mandate. And so with 128 MNAs, we were forced to beg, borrow, steal. We had to take independent MNAs. We had to take women reserves, religious reserves. But the clash, there was never really a clash as to what you were saying. I'll give you an example. November 2019, colleagues of mine from People and Noon, People's Party and Noon League told me that the deal was complete and Khan would be removed within a month. Uh, as soon as General Bajwa got his extension, Khan was in his way out because Bajwa was going to honor his deal with Shahbaz Sharif. Now, this is way before the vote of no confidence. I took this information to a couple of colleagues who said, look, don't be surprised by anything that happens. We're not a country that likes democracy in the sense that those, the powers that be don't like democracy because it simply means you'll have a normalization of, of everything in Pakistan, which would happen in Bangladesh or Thailand or the Philippines. We're not aiming to be Germany just yet. And so this is my version of it, that uh, when Khan said, when Khan's, uh, when the particular, the air base was asked for in Pakistan, the rumors we heard, I have no first-hand info, no files that I can talk about, but the rumors that we heard at the time in the assembly is that the Americans had asked for a base in Pamir, which is essentially Afghanistan. And the idea was to scuttle the CPEC, the, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, along with keeping an eye, a closer eye on Iran at the behest of Israel, and also contain Afghanistan agreed. We, though all the talks in Doha that we know of with the Taliban at that time, which was sponsored by Qatar, were completely, um, how do you say, consensual. So one doesn't get the idea of wanting to control Afghanistan yet again when you chose to leave the country. And of course, that simply meant more Pakistanis dying, whether it is the KP border, whether it is the Balochistan border. And of course, then the Ukraine thing came in much later, but that was a fake scenario. That was all nonsense because you and I both know that there is no way Khan could have gone on a trip to Russia 
uh, after 10 years of having no diplomatic uh, tangible diplomatic visits or relations without the full knowledge and the full backing of all the forces in Pakistan. So my way of looking at it is that Khan refused to be their poster boy. And uh, they may well have picked him, <clears throat> but they counted on him being like the Sharifs and Zardavis. And I think when that failed, when they figured out he doesn't have sticky fingers like the rest, he's a rich man in his own right. So um, I think that's where things started going wrong, but not in particular for the establishment per se, for the plans that have been laid out well in advance 20 years ago, uh, and that I'll explain in another question, but the plans to sort of dismantle Pakistan is no longer a theory because I'm one of the few people who've been subject to it, who've been, uh, you know, I haven't been sitting on the sidelines on the fence, but I've been actually uh, physically present in discussions more than 25 years ago when I didn't understand what those discussions meant. So sort of operations scuttle Pakistan or break up Pakistan into five manageable pieces, that is definitely underway. And neither Pakistan army benefits from that, neither Pakistani police nor Pakistani people. So let's put it this way, it is a huge plan. And the conspiracy theories we all hear of, unfortunately, this one is all too true. That's really stuff, uh, Shandana yeah. Guzar. You're placing a huge onus on not just the, the military establishment, but also our foreign friends. Um, this is this is really heavy, but besides the 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 rumors and the drawing room circuit and the grapevine, uh, which uh, which uh, grows far and wide in that uh, lovely city of Islamabad where you currently are, besides that, what about just good old fashioned facts? For example, um, the uh, legal own goals that uh, your party is currently being blamed uh, for scoring or even uh, events which uh, happened on the 9th of May, where there are clearly, clearly there, there is evidence that not all PTI workers or not all PTI leaders who've been blamed for it, but some PTI workers and some PTI um, middle management leaders did, for example, um, uh, conduct anti-state activities. Um, May 9th, for reference, of course, uh, happened last year. Uh, when there were riots, uh, some of them uh, um, impromptu uh, uh, all over the country when Imran Khan, hours after Imran Khan, got arrested. And of course, a lot of this is uh, uh, self-inflicted. For example, a lot of legal analysts say that your legal team could have done a, a much better job uh, earlier this year when uh, the Supreme Court was hearing uh, one of what you allege is a case of pre-poll rigging your a vaunted uh, election symbol, the bat, uh, being stripped away from you uh, by the Supreme Court of Pakistan and the Election Commission of Pakistan. So there's some self-inflicted problems here as well. This isn't just uh, the Israelis and the Americans going to town and chopping up Pakistan into pieces. Don't you think that there's some sort of there has to be some sort of admission about um, about your own um, your own faults? Of course, obviously. Uh, you may not know this, but I've said it in quite a few interviews. Uh, I was one of the few MNAs uh, on the receiving end of Khan Saab's wrath. He used to often block my uh, WhatsApp number once for 10 months because I got into an argument uh, with him uh, about my then advisor, then minister. So I've always been known to be um, slightly outspoken, very outspoken, because I have little or nothing to lose if I left my cushy job in Europe, my cushy job in Pakistan, and I joined parliament with, uh, you know, uh, heavy home responsibilities. And, and I chose to, as a single woman, to put myself out there. It wasn't so I could please anyone, not even Khan Sa. The idea is to fix this country. I moved back here because at once I saw Khan's governance, regardless of how many gaps it may have had, one wishes for better people, better governance, but he was miles ahead of those people that have ruled us for the last 46, 47 years at this point in time. Uh, the, the kleptomaniacs, as I call them, the klepto dynasties. But if you'll allow me for just a second, I want to um, go back to the previous discussion we were having just to tell you my personal experience with this, and it'll sort of come to the mistakes we made. And I hope that's okay. So back in to, uh, 1994 or 95, I don't remember the year, 96, 96. Uh, my father was then, I'm not sure if he was Commissioner Peshawar, uh, he was Commissioner Peshawar. And some family friends of ours visited, they were foreigners, family friends. I'd known them for years, I was far too young, 18, 19, to understand the implications. Uh, when they left, my father threw a fit, he was incredibly angry and he said that, look, 
these people cannot come to our house again. And I said, I don't understand. This is pre Musharraf. And he said that uh, uh, they were from a particular agency, an international agency, and they offered him a ton of money and foreign passports for his children, for his wife, everyone, if we would participate in the breakup of, of Pakistan, the, the breakup of the provinces, starting with KP, my province. And there was plenty of money where this was coming from. And the idea was at that time that KP would become a part of Afghanistan, you know, the whole Duran line issue. Balochistan would be handed over as the only province to Pakistan, whatever remained of Pakistan. Uh, Sindh would be a part of Greater Sindh. I honestly don't know how they thought they were going to get Sindh out of India. Punjab would be merged with Greater, uh, would become Greater Punjab again. That province would be taken from uh, Indian Punjab. So a bit airy fairy. And GB, AJK, and um, uh, Magbuza Kashmir, occupied Kashmir, that would, uh, the Aga Khan would become the prime minister of that. So this I'm telling you way before Imran Khan ever stepped into the uh, political graveyard that we are today. And so my father was angry and boiling and he said, why would you ask me to do that? And interestingly, they brought up his ethnicity that you're a Pathan, you hate uh, the Punjab, in particular, you hate the Punjabi army. And my, my father said, that is not a term we use anymore in this country. That is something East Pakistanis or Bangladeshis say. We are one Pakistan. We're different provinces, different cultures, different languages, but we're united by faith. Uh, so why would you expect me to go that way? And so they said, you know, the sickening answer he got in response was that we've already got 20 top civil servants of KPK in our pocket. The rest of the provinces are in our pocket too. You're just delaying the inevitable. So my father was shaken because as he, as he later many years recounted to his friends that he was a middle upper middle income, low middle income, whichever way you look at it, civil servant officer from KPK who struggled really hard to make sure that his area gets an education, his kids get an education. Uh, so why would he go for something so insidious against the only country that gives him some sort of recognition? So to say that this is only the establishment or, or me trying to cozy up to GHQ, that's not how it works. It's the reality as it stood and my father's no longer around. God bless his soul to defend him, but there's plenty of other witnesses that I have in our house who remember this conversation. It's pretty chilling today, too. So that's why I don't say it's an Israeli or American conspiracy per se. If you have willing Arab collaborators, uh, uh, you know, people who are willing to sell out Pakistan for a cheap buck, then I don't blame uh, imperialists. That's how imperialists operate. That is how they control the world. But to come back to our own mistakes, our legal team. I'll let you off. Let you off the hook for a minute uh, on, sure. on on your on your own mistakes. We can circle back to that. I just want a okay. quick follow up on this, uh, mm -hmm. but I want to contemporize it. Do you sure. find it strange that um, uh, people in the diplomatic enclave in Islamabad right now, the high commissioners and the ambassadors and the counselors and the attaches, um, are from, especially from Western countries, the Canadians, the Brits, the Americans? Uh, are spending a lot of time meeting people in the PMLN, people in the PPP, uh, including women, um, but not uh, really anyone in the PTI. They haven't, for example, uh, doing the same photo ops they've been doing in Lahore, in Peshawar. They haven't uh, been doing the same photo ops that they're doing in Karachi where, with the, the Nafisa Shahs of the world or the Mariam Nawazes of the world that they're doing uh, over there versus with the likes of you. Um, do you sense uh, 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 some sort of a discriminatory attitude post-election from your friends uh, in the diplomatic enclave? Uh, one such friend, somebody I truly regarded as a friend, uh, was an emissary for one particular embassy that was heavily involved in the vote of no confidence. Uh, it was my bad luck or their bad luck that I hadn't slept much the night before. I was traveling that day to Indonesia. So, um, you know, one has travel anxiety. And when I went to that particular embassy, they'd forgotten to let my car in because I went to the residence uh, instead of going to the, uh, to the office where the visa work would normally take place or interviews. So when I went in, um, I was quite surprised at the interview because there were political attaché and the defense attaché were sitting there. And I said, look, I have no business in commerce anymore. As I mentioned, I've resigned from commerce ministry. I do not get along with my advisor, for which I was blocked on WhatsApp. So I don't see why you've called me here. And they said, well, we just want to figure out where this is going. And I wasn't quite sure. This is early February 2022. And I said, uh, so what are we talking about? I thought we had been called to talk about the women's development agenda. At the point, at that point, I was the Commonwealth uh, Women Parliamentarians Chair. So I thought it was going to be something combining women and commerce, women and economy. And 
and said they said well we're really worried that uh, your party may not stay in power much longer and people like you are needed you're an, you're an alleged asset for this country so what do you intend to do and that was news to me i said well i'm not sure what you're talking about and the person in question said that well uh, we have news to believe that two powerful people uh, would like you to leave imran khan's party and i said that is not happening i'm a very small peg in this entire um, gamut of of of, of uh, whatever you call us um, you know, the little pickles that we are what role do i have to play and she said no it doesn't work like that it doesn't and the other two uh, they also said it it doesn't work like that so i wasn't quite sure we were going with that conversation so i said let's uh, i had my phone with me so i put it on flight mode and i said look let's just be clear what do you want and they said well we'd like you to consider moving to the people's party or to noon league or to uh, jyf and i said look both bilawal and mariam their education is far less than mine i know this is an arrogant thing to say but i was sleepy at the time and enraged so not a good combination and why would i join them they they corrupt dynasties and why would i be beholden to people who know less than me who have less job experience than me who have never worked a day in their life to earn 5 rupees that's not how this country is going to be fixed regardless of how well or they may or they may not speak english that's not how you run countries and i said for jyf i remember i told a terrible joke which i can't repeat here jyf why wouldn't join them <laughs> so i remember the joke as well and i reco- i knew something was up so i came out and the mistake they made at that point since my vehicle was not in the premises it was outside um i turned to the emissary and asked uh, they asked in fact why don't you have your car inside and i said well, you didn't allow me so went outside my driver my bodyguard they both said that five different intelligence agencies were asking questions as to why i had entered uh, the embassy and the residence and so of course i ran straight to speaker house where asad kaiser was then the speaker i told him i told the then cm parvez khatak not knowing he was part of it i also uh, told asad omar uh, to convey this to khan I also said it in a TV interview with Ali Haider at the same evening because I was still in shock and nobody took it too seriously till I started comparing notes with my other colleagues uh, in the assembly and many of them who have either uh, children with american nationality or canadian or british or german or something they'd all been approached by different embassies and been told that it might be in their best interest to save their careers a similar thing happened uh, when I came back from indonesia a colleague from noon league approached me and asked me to Uh, leave my party and join them for the best interest of pakistan and for the best interest of my career so of course from then it was being approached from all sides and uh, being bribed with all sorts of interesting things uh, never money interesting i wonder why they don't offer me money but they offer me pretty much everything else so that's why the friends and we have a diplomatic enclave they're terrified right now <clears throat> because i'd also caught another uh, diplomat in those days with a, an mpa from punjab also reserve woman candidate and when i put two and two together by that time it was too late all these actors the five that i know that had approached pti members all five of them had been posted out only 3 to 6 to 9 months into their tenure and i remember the names of the three two of them i don't so i know for sure it was done by them god knows what they were thinking they used ukraine as the excuse all will be forgiven blah 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 it was never about ukraine it was only about because now they're pulling out of ukraine and now all of a sudden ukraine doesn't matter anymore and you'll see that in the next couple of months so you know that entire drama of why khan went to russia and bought russian oil we never bought it we negotiated why would khan buy russian wheat we negotiated we never bought it we knew the uh, shortage was coming i was working with agriculture uh, committee in the commerce in, in in the assembly so it was a hugely costly mistake uh, by whoever did it in pakistan but it cost i mean the kind of things they've done to us the dehumanizing things they've done to the country um and i don't know if you've noticed right now there is sort of an atmosphere an air of the taunt in pakistan but they thought that they're requesting is sort of we you know we put your show on your head and you agree to peace that's not how peace works so we've made billions of mistakes along the way and happy to talk about them i don't know if you know i'm that i'm the most unpopular person in my party right now i've always been and i sort of take that as a medal because everybody hates me so does my own party but that's fine i stand nothing to gain by lying well we're glad well, we're glad, we're glad you joined us because uh, a lot of this hasn't been very well articulated i must say by your party and the very fact that you back it up with these uh, important personal anecdotes really clarifies things at least for me because i hate saying it but you guys have done quite a but terrible actually, job quite a terrible job at articulating and putting evidence together uh, so far it's 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 been it's been a little bit of everything hasn't it uh, uh, the cipher uh uh the um um the army uh, the dynast uh, the the kleptocrats the overall bit 
gets quite confounding. But uh, I'm going to try to wrap this up with one final question um, because there's so much to unpack. And I hope you join us again, perhaps for a more uh, local um, taste of politics. Um, but Shandana Gulzar Khan, uh, you've laid it out. Uh, some, some of the many causes seem to be uh, not from within Pakistan, but from without Pakistan. Um, where do you see all of this going now? I mean, if you are going to be unpopular, uh, be a little more unpopular and, 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 and in fact, brutal in your assessment. Is there any light at the end of the tunnel here or uh, are you done for right now uh, as a party? Okay, that's three questions. I'll see how I can uh, go or go go over them in a sequential order. I guess I, I guess again, like the last time, I'll jump to my previous uh, answer. Uh, perhaps one of the reasons our party hasn't done a good articulation is because anybody who does articulate it to the best of their ability, they get picked up, abducted, they have to carry out press conferences, their families get molested and harmed and abused. You can't imagine the price some of us have paid to tell the truth. I think this has to do a lot with American foreign policy and perhaps the wrong sort of people making the American foreign policy. It has little to do with Pakistan because you know the old uh, adage that when America catches a cold, the rest of the world sneezes. There's no doubt that our economies are intricately linked with that of the United States, with that of Europe and the Gulf. So we, what we have in PTI or in Ran Khan or in people like us, we're not anti-West. I've spent 10 years of my life in the West. We're not anti-UAE or the Gulf. We're not anti-anyone. What we are is pro-Pakistan. And to borrow from a figure that is, I know, not exactly loved much in the US, Donald Trump, he always said America first. And then, of course, he follows it up with other things, but make America great again. Our problem is different. We've never put Pakistan first. It's always been our sense of underconfidence, our sense, our low self-esteem, our lack of, of, of trusting the fact that we are also a nation capable of greatness, capable of doing good things. Perhaps we aim for the good first and the best later because, you know, the best is always the enemy of the good. We have really bad uh, confidence issues. And because of that, we're only too uh, keen to jump ship suddenly when stabilization occurs in Pakistan, in particular economic stabilization, which is the key, the key to all of this. Khan left this economy at a 6% growth rate. I've been a commerce person for my entire life and career now. And I've never witnessed $36 billion. It's not a huge number. Uh, but exports from Pakistan in 76 years of its existence. So clearly there is a bunch of people out there that want to keep us poor, whether it's internal or external, I leave that up to you. It, nobody's ever completely innocent and nobody's ever completely guilty. There's always choices to be made. And if we Pakistanis continue to make bad choices, then we can't blame anybody else that wishes to interfere. Having said that, where is Pakistan right now? I think we're at, at a precipice. We are also facing an existential crisis in some sense. But we've never seen Pakistanis be so bold in front of abuse, murder, mayhem. There is hope. There is always hope. But right now, and I don't want to sort of um, make, uh, I don't know, I don't know how to say this, glamorize Khan any further than he already is. But despite being at loggerheads with him on so many issues, and I'm famous for being at loggerheads with him, I chose to stay with him and his party and his vision, regardless of whether it's Islamist, some people called him a chauvinist. Some people call him, he's been called everything under the sun, a playboy, you name it. You know, always contrasting statements. But he's either a playboy or a chauvinist. He's either an Islamist or a heretic. He can't be both. It just simply means that he's a flawed human being like the rest of us. He has a little bit of everything in him. He is prone to making mistakes like all of us. But what he's not is a hypocrite. He corrects his mistakes. He used to call him Mr. U-turn for that. What he is not is disloyal to Pakistan. And we have plenty of examples of people who wrote the US administration in the past, begging them to intervene, either to make the PM president. We even have a really sad leak of General Pervez Musharraf, God bless his soul now, where he's talking to certain <clears throat> lobbyists in Capitol Hill about how to return him to power and he'd sort out everything for the Americans. So we have that uh, you know, evidence on board. So he's one man who fears nothing, and I think that gives us all courage. He fears his Lord, sure, that's the Islamic proselytizing part of him, but why not? Every country has a right to live the way they choose to. If people don't like the Islamic part of Pakistan, that's fine. We can have a constitution. We can be tolerant of every kind of behavior. In fact, we're one of the first countries in the world that has three genders in its passport and its ID cards. So I think we really need to give the man a break because he has done far more for Pakistan 
Khan is simply a symbol for Pakistan. And that's how I think. Nowadays, things are pretty much black and white. Eventually, we'll go back to the days, inshallah, when we have more gray on the prism, on the spectrum. But now is not the time.